This paper seeks to extend J. Baird Calicott's observation that environmentalism must move from a conservation to sustainability mentality in order to recuperate the objective of nurturing healthy ecosystems. By analyzing conceptual barriers to that shift as they exist in the context of post-colonial American cultural history. Using the written literature and oral record of American culture that demonstrates sensitivity to the shaping power of both settler colonial and indigenous culture, I trace the evolutions of the keyword environment through a culturally comparative framework using the indigenous concept of Aloha Aina as a lens. Aloha Aina is a natural resource management framework native to Hawaiian culture and indigenous to the Hawaiian islands. Existing as it presently does within a colonized condition subordinate to the settler colonial model that determines policy making in the state, this framework is both culturally incompatible with the Western model that controls it and, to put it in Western terms, superior to it. My hope is that by decolonizing the term environment, and situating it in historical and cultural context, I may reveal the living concept of Aloha Aina trapped within it. By doing so, I hope we may begin to collectively release our Aloha back to the Aina, like a long sought rain after an endless drought, and help restore to life for Americans the old, ancient even, memory of how to care for the earth. Keyword, environment. This project situates the keyword environment in a cross-cultural historical context with emphasis on its usage in colonial American history. I aim to catalog indigenous definitions of the concept to make my case that the current ethnocentric usage predominant in policy making today discriminates against alternate paradigms of sustainable development in which human intervention is implicated in environment, not separate from it. This perceived separation is demonstrably relative as evidenced by numerous eloquent testimonies, such as that of standing bears in the land of the spotted eagle, where he testifies that the association of knowledge with all the creatures of the earth caused the Lakota to look to them for knowledge and assuming their spiritual fineness to be of the quality of their own, seek with them a true rapport, and which Calicott references in his seminal piece, The Wilderness Idea Revisited, to establish the premise that much well-intentioned environmental policy is based on this genetic, conceptual, culturally relative error and is inadequate to provide solutions. The separation of humans from their environment has been naturalized such that policy decisions gear environmental work toward conservation instead of to successful stewardship. Thanks to the work of researchers like Calicott, however, we have a new paradigm with which to conceptualize the ecological problems faced by the Western European model of development that first falsely assumes the position that man and environment are ontologically separate and distinct and next asserts this assumption to be absolutely true, not the culturally relative position that it is. This keyword analysis will demonstrate that human technology was intrinsic to the indigenous paradigm of the environment in which human intervention was a natural affair. Calicut recuperates the social constructionist point of view that systems are based on strategies of attention determined by intention especially along what is still often construed as the inalienable atomic axes of binaries like man, woman, and humans, nature. But Calicott iconoclastically marries that claim to the claim that not all constructions are equal. As a consequence, environmentalism in its current state is exposed to be hemmed in by an information-poor cultural iron curtain that has left American capitalist culture in a state of benighted dysfunction. Through comparative analysis with cultures who construe the environment as something continuous with the human biology, psychology, spirit, and knowledge base, the term environment becomes something more than its development along one axis of historical time. Cross-cultural variation in usage and application may modify assumptions about what the environment is and isn't that have been naturalized in the Western model, but which are, in fact, 
relative to the semantics of capitalist culture. An example of a culture whose construction of environment is incommensurate with the definition in play in late American capitalist culture is the Aloha Aina or Uamau Ke'ea o Ka'aina i Kapono of Hawaii, which ties ethical action to right or pono treatment of the land or Aina. Also of importance are accounts of relationships with the land prior to and after the period of land enclosures in England, pre and post Tudor, which marked a seismic shift in the way natural resources had been stewarded and managed up until that time, as a modern money system was gradually adopted and steps were taken to industrialize the area's resource base and centralize management of it. I am examining here, as Vermonia Alston does in passing, the mainstream preoccupation with wilderness traditions, pastor pastoralism, and the romantic impulse of nature writing as fetishism, but emphasize the 14th century, but I emphasize the 14th century change in usage that occurs at the time the word nature is replaced with environs, a French word from which the English term environmentalism ultimately derives. Austin attends to Raymond Williams' omission of the term environment in his classic keywords text by foregrounding Williams' entry on nature, enacting what will be this term's erasure in the first and second editions of the Bridget and Hendler's Keywords for American Cultural Studies by performing an interview in the absence of the term environment in Williams' book. That the term Williams elides recurs with a vengeance is evident from the noticeable absence of the entry on nature in the first two editions of Burgett and Hendler, where it is subordinated to the term environment. The term environment nonetheless already exists as a premonitory cultural artifact in Raymond Williams' classic keywords, a vocabulary of culture and society. Here, nature still precedes environment as a classic keyword. If the concept of the environment, as Calicott asserts, is a result of Western philosophers of nature becoming enamored of the scientific method, we can discern a snapshot of its usage and inchoate manifestation from 1978, the date of Keyword's publication, by searching for all the entries in which the term science appears, and then also searching for all the entries in which the term nature appears. By cross-referencing them, we get the following list of entries organic, psychological, cultural, materialism, genetic, ideology, doctrinaire, culture, behavior, determinism. Environment, in other words, emerges as an inchoate index of alienation, the space conventionally observed by natural philosophers to be a living reality coterminal with human consciousness is expunged and effectively converted to property, coincident with the penning of the Noam Organum by Francis Bacon, the Noam Organum was said by Bacon to be a tribute to King James, and in tongue-in-cheek, a response to the King James Bible, completed in his lifetime. In it, Bacon posed his challenge to the King James Bible, which he assisted in penning, by asserting that an even greater work of humankind lay ahead, and he sought to demonstrate it through the composition of a treatise structurally analogous to the tr King James Bible, in which he presented his great work, The Scientific Method, or New Science or as he called it, the Noam Organum, Latin for the new method. This was his response to the English God, nature, state, and religion into which he was born. What was the scientific method? And considering its introduction into the canon of English thought over a century prior to the American Revolution on the brink of the War of the Three Kingdoms, or English Civil War, what does it have to do with transplanting the environment onto the natural world? The birth of the method and the term coincides with the dawning of global capitalism, the expansion of colonialism, the industrial revolution, and the triumph of people over nature. Does this mean anything? How did the environment with its origins in environs and the imported practice of land enclosure come to pluck out brains and all from the local inhabitants, as Iago says of himself in Othello, when searching to complement Desdemona, but lacking all invention to contrive one whilst mentally occupied with secretly plotting her murder. How did the culturally relative concept of the environment resound in the ears of people who saw the term used to service the extermination of their habitat? 
In the 14th century, Enverons emerges in Wycliffe's translation of the Bible as an interpretation of the classical Latin circuitus, meaning around. This reveals the logic of enclosure embedded in Anglo-Saxon culture and the promotion of this logic through the writing of the Bible. In its early 13th century Anglo-Norman and Middle French usage, the Oxford English Dictionary most commonly finds environs to signify frontiers, boundaries, circumference, or surroundings. The environment is thus synonymous with the emergence of the English language and comes into full flower during the High Middle English period of the Plantagenet era, in which, the old, which preceded the Old English phase of Norman England, shortly antecedent, that is, to the House of Anjou creation of the Magna Carta, which was originally entitled The Great Charter of the Liberties of England and the Liberties of the Forest. Since the Magna Carta will become the model for the legal system upon which colonialism is built, it is significant that its creation historically precipitates the advent of the word environment in the English language. The United States has a colonial history. <clears throat> and English colonists called the new lands of North America and Australia wilderness, an idea taken originally from the English translation of the Bible. This designation enabled them to see the American and Australian continents as essentially empty of human beings and thus available for immediate occupancy. The Australian bureaucratic term for wilderness, terra nullius, a Latin phrase meaning empty land, says it all quite explicitly. So does the Wilderness Act of 1964, which defines wilderness as an area of undeveloped federal land retaining its primeval character and influence without permanent improvements or human habitation. So what is our common habitat if nature, by way of the environment, has been defined as a terra nullius, that with a primeval character untarnished by human habitation in the founding legislation on which policy is built in America. For a broader perspective, I turn now to the long view provided by Our Common Habitat, a report provided by the World Commission on Environment and Development, written for the United Nations in 1987, in which the substitution of the wilderness concept in place of mutually sustaining relationships between people and their surroundings is complete. In part three of this report, this dissociated alienation is reenacted in its eponymous title, Common Endeavors, Conflict as a Source of Unsustainable Development. The inversion of cause for effect here substitutes conflict as the cause of unsustainable development instead of the more logically intuitive conclusion that unsustainable development causes conflict. The consequence of this sleight of hand is environmental policy, which has failed to provision sustainable outcomes through the management of natural resources. This abysmal state of dysfunction has produced the sustainability movement as a unique entity distinct from the environmental movement. Adam Rome's reflections in 2001 situate the recognition of the dysfunction of this socially constructed notion of the environment to adequately support sustainable systems of human development over the long term at the origins of the sustainability movement, in which he locates the post-war period circa 1959 via reference to a Life magazine article by William White on Levitt's America entitled A Plan to Save a Vanishing U.S. Countryside. The sustainability movement can thus be seen as a natural consequence of the alienation of people from the mutually causal relationship with their habitat that existed prior to the construction of the environment out of the world around them, first during the pre-colonial land enclosures of the Plantagenet period, as documented in the etymological record, and then during its suburbanization under late American capitalist culture as it is chronicled by Elizabeth Cohen in her analysis of the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944, in which she dissects the confiscation of public infrastructure by military contracted suburban development under the central coordination of the still nascent federal government reconverted for post-war civilian life to restructure society, manufacture consent, and reinforce the authority of the consumer business model of American life. 
1962 Statistical Reporting Service, the United States Department of Agriculture, which discontinued reporting the number of horses and mules on farms because they were no longer significant to farm production, is an index of the impact of post-war policy on the relationship between the average American farmer and the land. Where is the environment in this? Good question. James Howard Gunstler charges and condemns suburban living conditions for the death of the American habitat in the geography of nowhere through its replacement with the agoraphobia producing spectacle that politicians proudly call growth where 80% of everything ever built in America has been built in the last 50 years, and most of it is depressing, brutal, ugly, unhealthy, and spiritually degrading as the jive plastic commuter tract home wastelands, the Potemkin village shopping plazas with their vast parking lagoons, the Lego block hotel complexes, the gourmet mansardic junk food joints, the Orwellian office parks, featuring buildings sheathed in the same reflective glass as the sunglasses worn by the chain gang guards, the particle board garden apartments rising up in every meadow and cornfield, the freeway loops around every big and little city with their clusters of discount merchandise marts, the whole destructive, wasteful, toxic, agoraphobia-inducing spectacle that politicians proudly call growth. The roots of this construction of the environment as something opposed to human intervention can be unearthed in colonial American history through the Recorder's Office land administration records from the Gloucester Plantation days of the expanding Massachusetts Bay Colony in the 1640s. As Daniel Beaver's important study of the Massachusetts Bay Colony's archives from 1642 to 1650 documents, it is increasingly clear that these mundane rights of occupation were joined through the language of charter and treaty to a high political discourse of imperium and dominium, the Roman law terms in which the English crown and its agents justified royal sovereignty over its new world dominions to other European powers during the late 16th and early 17th centuries. The published ordinances of the 1642 Gloucester meeting requiring the building of dwelling houses and fencing as marks to confirm possession further delineates the rise of the environs as a staple land policy from the point of view of enclosure. Under the bylaws of colonial Gloucester, property could be lost if not built upon. This politics of property that involved control over the offices that conferred title to land were important not only in the making of property, but to the construction of the environment that will be built upon the, these precedents of law. The record of these early transactions in the Massachusetts Bay Colony extends back to 1639 in the holdings of the established general court, which had administered a patent for the fishing plantation on Cape Ann that year, on behalf of the London merchant Maurice Thompson. The recorder's project in New England began to take shape in 1635, when Obadiah Bruin, the youngest son of John Bruin and Bruin Stapleford in Cheshire, acquired a share in the Piscuitaqua plantation project as part of a syndicate drawn from the powerful company of drapers in Shrewsbury, to which Obadiah himself belonged. Although the explicit political significance of English corporate and manorial approaches to land law in these settlements have not been yet been understood. Bruin's town book of the Gloucester Plantation provides a useful point of departure for further study of the quintessentially colonial American construction of land law and the rescripting of land that had been human habitat to land as property in a system of exchange that benefited the corporate landholders of incorporated bodies, such as the Massachusetts Bay, Virginia, Plymouth, and London companies at the expense of both the settlers who were used to colonize the region and the indigenous who were colonized or exterminated. The entitlement to possess land expressed an imperial prerogative that imposed a construction on human habitat that put that habitat in the service of the crown or one of its incorporated bodies. The early colonies were such bodies and it is upon the basis of their tradition of administering the land that land policy is built in the United States. Early Dutch, English, and French American settlers brought milling technologies from Europe in unison with these administrative traditions, 
further transforming human habitat in accordance with the capitalist mode of produ production supported by the administrative procedures and processes for managing land and resources of which the records of the General Court of, the early, Glo of early Gloucester and Bruins Town record compose a 1639 to 1650 period sample. Dam building for water power in the Eastern United States began in the late 1600s and persisted until the early 1900s. Dams and races that delivered water from the pond upstream of a dam were built to run iron forges, furnaces, mining operations, and most commonly, mills. We refer to all these water-powered activities as milling. Before the adoption of steam engines during the late 19th century, every mill required a mill dam reservoir to supply a relatively constant head and reliable supply of water. Whig politician John C. Spencer's observation in 1847 that the United States was a boundless hydrographical system was not lost on the Army Corps of Engineers. Created officially in 1802 by the Jefferson administration as a war academy and fort building agency, it was originally organized in 1779 by an act of Congress commanded by George Washington and composed mostly of French engineer scholars from the court of Louis XIV. This institution's role in fort building contributed to a rise in the usage of the term environs within the military as a comparative study of the letters of revolutionary officers alongside those from the Civil War reveals, this special civilizing influence of property ownership on the indigenous population went hand in hand with the model of scientific imperialism inherited directly from the court of Versailles during the French Indian Wars to rationalize the genocide resulting from their technological advantage over the indigenous population as a side effect of the colonization of natural mineral resources. The core leadership, borrowing chiefly from the French model, favored a planned economy where the army guided construction and science was the methodological tool of a rational, centralized state and resisted the British example of the self-made builder mechanic in a freewheeling capitalist system. Enverons emerges in writings on heraldry, chivalry, courtly behavior, and in connection with the enclosure of property by water, as well as in tributes to the knightly tradition of the French court and property as it is construed in the round according to this imperial system. The Lawns Cohen catalogues as part of Levitt's property post-war America are thus, in fact, a latter-day expression of the old English Lawns, from the old French land, which declines over time to become the word land in the English language, thus implicitly expressing that the environment as it is constructed in America is still an extension of the 14th century court, manor, and manorial land law that became a tool for colonialism and helped advance a new order of things through the imperial disregard for any human habitat held in common by people who are not subordinate to a sovereign central authority. The term environment in the context of American studies can thus be seen as a tool for colonizing natural resources and naturalizing a politics based on property as political capital. Under this paradigm, sustainability concerns are the inevitable reaction of a habitat rendered unsustainable due to its subordination to a system of production impervious to its requirements for sustenance. American culture, from the transcendentalism of Walden Pond to the passage of the Environmental Protection Act under Nixon, to Rachel Carson's 1960 countercultural classic Silent Spring, exhibits nostalgia for a habitat from which humans have not been alienated under colonial capitalism, while simultaneously reordering this habitat as an environment where longing for what has been replaced has been neutralized with an impulse to conserve and consume. But Winona Leduc states simply in her analysis of American environmental issues, a society based on conquest cannot be sustained. Roosevelt's 1930s Civilian Conservation Corps was wildly popular according to the Pittsburgh Press in 1939. John Muir's legacy of conservation policy has ennobled the Sierra Club, the National Park System, and the modern environmental movement. 
But if the key to sustainability is accountability to natural law, as the Duke asserts in her discussion in Native Peoples and the Environmental Crisis, then a concept of the environment crafted from land administration policy based on the colonial construction of the natural world as something to be divided up, exchanged or conserved can only inhibit sustainability. The recent birth of the caricature of the ecologically noble savage expresses the incompatibility of the Euro-American cultural assumptions of conservationist and environmentalism with indigenous culture. If sustainability is to be achieved, the degraded concept of the environment must first be recuperated for a post-colonial culture. This implies stepping outside the constraints of colonial constructions to assume a socioeconomic perspective that recognizes the reciprocity of humans and habitat in continuous inhabitation of place, or as Winona Le Duc says, recovering the sacred. The Ecology by Hand Study Abstract. Before the arrival of Captain James Cook in 1778, Kanaka Maoli water management practices were able to sustain a landscape of native crops in uplands of 4,000 feet elevation in regular growth and well-stocked fisheries that could support an estimated population of 800,000 to a million. Today, the state of Hawaii waters management practices yield only negligible quantities of native crops upland and no well-stocked fisheries able to support a local population of comparable size. This paper will be a comparative study between the indigenous water management practices still active in the West and East Maui Mountains and state practices derived from Western cultural models which are currently trending. By compiling an archive of oral interviews and research with practitioners in Kanaka Maoli water management, I will examine how cultural practitioners have maintained these indigenous natural systems despite colonization. State practices will be examined in parallel with indigenous practices in the field in the presence of aquatic biologist and representative of Hawaii Department of Aquatic Resources, Skippy Howe, who also acts as water steward of the Lakoa'ia and traditional cultural practicer, practitioner in the West Maui Mountains watershed and the Lo'ikalo fieldwork will be conducted under the supervision of practitioner Penny Levin. The fieldwork I did involved transporting hihivai upstream above present-day diversions with Hawaiian elder aquatic marine biologist with the Hawaii State Department of Aquatic Resources and Kanaka Oive cultural practitioner of traditional marine systems management. Skippy Howell. These diversions obstruct the traditional migration of amphidormous marine organisms such as oopu and hiivai. By virtue of the precautionary principle, these marine organisms fall under the data deficient category in which species for whom we do not have enough data to determine if they should be classed as endangered are placed. Because of this classification, this work demonstrates it is proper that resources be allocated to facilitate the extraordinary rehabilitation of these species by taking the initiative to do so. This work was undertaken for the purposes of documenting, archiving, and eventually databasing and making accessible work already underway in the field so that the traditional cultural practices such as those modeled here by Uncle Skippy Howe can be replicated elsewhere with the goal of eventual large scale ecological systems restoration. Calicut was central to my work in Maui, which was based on making the case that the indigenous eco resource management practices constituted a technology transfer that should be recognized. The ability to cross cultural boundaries between the kupuna and the policymakers at state and local levels was a crucial piece of a strategy to retain governance of water resources based on stewardship rights precedent to but acknowledged in the Hawaii State Constitution. I was truly blessed to assist a Hawaiian elder who worked for the Department of Land and Natural Resources on a project to restore the degraded ecology of the Iao and West Maui Mountain Rivers. 
The sugar plantations still extant and diverting all their resources the colonial hunger could muster while I was there in 2010, until their unnatural union with Monsanto and the collapse, their collapse into biotech drained the rivers dry of their water just as they reached the ocean, depriving the rivers of their breath, or their ha, as we say in Hawaii. The word Hawaii means breath of the waters. Vai is Hawaiian for water. The rivers were breathing from the ocean. It was a fantastic thing to perceive. The way the mountain was exchanging fresh water with the salty ocean and how the entire ecology of the riverbed depended on this imperceptible operation, which impacted not just what we couldn't see, the health of the riverbed, but what we western-eyed ones could, the fish. The cherished and beloved fish of the Hawaiian islands were depending in myriad intricate ways in which the rivers were breathing for the mountains, becoming their lungs and giving birth to this wonderful wonderland of flora, fauna, life and aquatic abundance as a result. But the diversions by Hawaiian commercial and sugar, providers of those HCNS sugar packets you see scattered across the US in cafes, restaurants and diners, pink packets, has weakened the great rivers of both the East and West Maui mountains that so much that they had lost their breath. They were no longer breathing. And so this kapuna, this old Hawaiian elder who worked our DLNR was doing his thing. He was tending the rivers and restoring, maintaining their ecology during this time of stress by transporting the little hihivai snails from the dry spots in the riverbed where they had been stranded on their journey and bringing them by hand in buckets up to the top of the mountain. The hihivai are central to the maintenance of the life cycle of the river and the marine ecology of Hawaii. Like o'opu, a type of gobi fish, the hihivai migrate up and down the rivers at different stages of life and act as messengers in the lungs of the mountain's freshwater streams and the ocean tide pools, which helped to generate the precious life in Hawaiian waters. Skippy Hau listened to the hihivai and the o'opu. He heard them crying and he tended them. I was honored and blessed to assist him on several of these trips. I documented it all with video and I recorded a talk story too. It's truly beautiful. I don't know what's happened since then. I haven't brought myself to look back yet. I had to leave Hawaii abruptly shortly after I found a chink in Monsanto's armor and gave it the beast my best stab. But I still have all the footage and documents and research I have yet to write up. Anyway, I remember stumbling across Calicott's work back in those days. I wanted to mention it to you, along with Mitch and Jorgensen's work on ecotechnology which was a great resource in the case I was trying to make, that technology is nothing new or foreign to either the environment or the indigenous. We, the West, are stuck in a backwards paradigm, using primitive technologies in a field we don't understand, sustainable natural resource management. I wanted to show how indigenous practices, given their due, can help educate our cultural ecological stupidity and provide the upgrade we need. We can't hear what these indigenous scientists and technicians have to say with our cultural biases in the way. So I wanted to remove them by showing the sophistication being brought to bear in the practices of elders like Skippy Howe, which demonstrate an appreciation of the entire ecological system and a holistic approach that is entirely foreign to Western natural resource management practices. I was privileged to have been inducted into the Hawaiian worldview and like a reverse Francis Bacon, I wanted to share it. The work is still to be accomplished. We have to translate the value of the indigenous knowledge base into Western terms so it can be appreciated and so outdated colonial industrial land management practices can be phased out and replaced with a more holistic, sophisticated system. To do so, cultural boundaries must be crossed and the case must be made. I was honored to be permitted to make those journeys with Skippy Howe. I also feel I have a kuleana, a responsibility for the vision I was given by then, by the Hawaii, <clears throat> Hihibai, by the mountains, the rain, the ocean, air, 10 years ago. I hear their prayer, it lives in me. 
It is my aloha now, part of the gift of breath that escapes and returns from me whenever I speak. It is the earth remembering through me, still breathing. Script. The first ha. Contemplation of the clouds. A day with Skippy Howe. The scene opens low in the valley. We hear it. From each corner and echoing, we hear the water in the air, the streams conversing. The effect forms geometries, and that geometry is a significance that transfers information as compactly, elegantly, and dramatically as a current of wind, its story to a bird. It is a moody day. Skippy house buckets of just spawning opa'ai, o'opu, and hi'ivai anchor the moment, but the laminated photographs of species and charts he holds up in succession tremble with the possibility of rain. Students are tucking their rain gear into pockets and backpacks as the valley shifts and considers under the contemplation of the clouds, but leans towards mist and no rain. We are learning the language that is not taught in books, a language that has never been codified because it cannot be translated into words. It is the water gossiping and laughing with the air. It is thunder as a vowel. It is the valley becoming undone and a flash flooding you with insight as it subtracts the time you have to make a decision. It is nature. It is her aina. If we use the terms interchangeably, although nature lacks the symbiotic and animated dimension the Aina embodies. In the full regalia of the laws she embodies and the necessity of recognizing and responding to them, her call, Meke Aloha Aina, in this time of need, while her systems under stress in present time are in urgent need of repair. Skippy proceeded to tell us about stream flow and the habits of aquatic organisms who maintain streams, ecologies, and how the practice of diversion destroys the entire system that these organisms create, which lead to stream filtration, vegetation transpiration, and the maintenance of a healthy hydrologic cycle, and in turn, the cooler climate. Perhaps more like the most equitable climate in the world, Naquina describes in her 1904 account, Hawaii Native Peoples. Skippy and I are ascending the long, curling steps that lead up from a few of the cascading pool spawning grounds of the Hihivai, O'opu, and the Opai in the Iao stream. These marine organisms are taxonomically unrelated but share a common evolutionary history. Although described as amphidromous, meaning primarily fishes who have moved between fresh and salt water habitats, not necessarily to breed. This term does not capture the full evolutionary majesty of what exists in nature cross especially in an extant record of organisms that not only exhibit this behavioral characteristic, but likewise have evolved physical tools, as in the case of the particular fish who changes its upper jaw into a hook in order to heft itself upstream to its destination to the O'opu Nanihā, who has fused its pelvic fins together into a suction cup to facilitate its gravity-destroying journey to the waterfall scaling Opai, who have evolved to vertically climb slick surfaces of rock under running waterfalls and unique techniques for migrating upstream that merit further study. Why was migrating upstream and against gravity so important? And what consequences does this activity have for the life of the stream? Are these marine organisms providing a service to stream ecology in symbiotic relationship with an aspect of the stream? Is there anything in common across all these different species that happens as a result of the fresh and salt water conversation of these upward migrations? That is the question I want to ask Skippy Howe. 
but our journey has not yet begun. I am not yet at the question asking stage. We are still ascending the steps and I am preparing my informed consent form for his signature, and we are in my recollection on the valley floor getting acquainted, stepping up to the level above, Skippy carrying his buckets just released of all their fertility in the mist and inquiry of the waters and still in his wetsuit. He wouldn't hear of me carrying a bucket. I had offered and felt a little ashamed that I had nothing to bear up the steps except my rush of questions to express my gratitude for the accomplishments of the morning. Skippy was gracious, but the ceremony he had performed, which was ceremonial even though it wasn't expressly shared in this manner with the group involved in the morning's activities, involved the significant gesture of one man moving these tiny hee vai by hand up the stream and this act may be doing much more to hold the stream's ecology together and so the treasure jewel of the Iao Valley which visitors from around the world come to see than anybody working in Western science presently dreams. Skippy had paused and was looking around us as we crossed the bridge which has always felt a bit like a bridge in an unfinished C.S. Lewis story inspired by his undisclosed trip to Hawaii to me, a portal of some kind, in other words, and as he listened to the peaks of the valley and what this special corridor, the expanse spanned by the body of the bridge we were crossing, had to communicate to the pools, cascades and streams below, he said, there are protocols. For example, if someone is harvesting at some time in a stream, I do not come to that area during that time. He was sharing the life of the stream, which is vibrant in spite of diversions and the ecological violence of channelization. At the top, before we had started down to release the spawning organisms in the stream, he had paused, looked around him and commented on how it always feels in the valley. Like air conditioning. Cool, yeah? And he demonstrated his listening to us. I can hear the water in the air here. Over where the diversions occur, there is no sound, no conversation of the water. But not only is it silent, the temperature is higher. It's hot. The water boils the larvae, and the area is arid. It's arid in sound as well as air. I realized at this point what Skippy had said and wanted to ask him something about it, but the question would have to wait. We were already on our way to release the organisms below. This question wasn't about amphidromy, but it was similar. We will see how, as the narrative progresses, what Skippy had just shared suggested the possibility that a study could be done proving the correlation between stream diversion and temperature rise or climate change. I was eager to ask him about it, but didn't trust my tongue to eloquently express the concept yet, and so held my breath. The two insights I had that day on the way up and down the valley elevations was that the information Skippy had used to relay whether or not any floods were imminent or the conditions safe for our excursion was being correlated with an array of other signifiers in a field that could only be claimed at the point where a person meets the laws of the world he inhabits. This intuition and instinct is combined as a form of knowledge that has no name to my knowledge in English, but which in Hawaiian culture is captured by the phrase aloha aina in the figure of the konohiki. For the purposes of this study and due the, to the lack of any further context with this type of knowledge in the West, the konohiki can be considered our environmental doctors those who see the limits, laws, and messages of things as they are, and behave to keep that environment in good order. Sometimes the message is a call, 
or an expression of need, like the call of the hihivai to migrate past the corporate diversions to the upper climbs of the deeply breathing streams. Seeing the invisible. So what is it Skippy sees, hears, pays attention to, that other scientists don't? What isn't there? The pattern, the larger intelligence of the system of which he is a symbiotic, responsive, transmitting and receiving part. He's hearing the why and the how of the water. And that intuition, multi-sensory knowledge, instructs him effectively how to behave, what to do, in order to care for the Aina. This is the journey we are about to take deep into the invisible living world that is already everywhere around you, breathing you alive, awake and asleep and amplified with ha. The O'opu get upstream with pelvic fins that form a suction cup. Hawaiian streams are typically rocky and precipitous, particularly in their upper reaches. Entry of streams into the ocean can range from waterfalls with rapid mixing to floodplains with rivers and estuaries. Paired fins underneath the body fused of the naniha form a sort of sucking disc. This allows the gobi to suck onto the rocks and climb upstream. It is a unique characteristic of the gobi family. Channel modification began of the streams in the 1930s and was primarily a result of bridge construction this type of construction included removal of riparian vegetation, realignment of channels, and reinforcement of altered banks. Flood control projects that occurred subsequently resulted in many streams having straightened, concrete-lined channels. This type of habitat is in sharp contrast to the natural stream environment, which is heavily vegetated, steep, and strewn with boulders. Concrete-lined flat bottom channels cause water temperatures to rise throughout the day, exceeding limits by tolerating native stream animals. Also, the homogeneity of the environment provides no hiding places for stream animals. Organisms that have been adapted to the rocky, precipitous, freshet flow nature of Hawaiian streams. Because of these reasons, concrete-lined channels are basically not suitable habitats for native stream species. Many of these diversions draw 100% of the median stream flow into channels and ditches for transport to agricultural fields. This results in the elimination of stream flow below diversions except during major precipitous events when rising waters are able to breach diversions. This type of diversion is extremely detrimental to the O'opu as well as native shrimps and snails that require access to the ocean to complete their amphidromous lifestyle. Stenogobios hawaiianensis, their preferred area of the stream are the deep pools and slow to moderate velocity runs. They live off a diet of worms, small shrimps, insects, and algae. They lay six to 8,000 eggs, which are guarded by the male until they hatch. After the eggs hatch, the small larvae are washed down into the ocean where they will live for half a year in tide pools before returning to the stream where they will spend the rest of their life. So the Naniha Gobi are like the messenger RNA of the stream. They are communicating with the fresh and salt water elements of the hydrologic cycle of the island. And this matrix of fresh and salt water is important however much we do or do not understand about the relation of saline and non-saline components of the island water cycle, we know it forms the basis of what is called the basal lens, a major portion of island groundwater which negotiates a cap on the saltwater portion of the groundwater supply, thus acting as an essential control valve for the maintenance of naturally occurring fresh groundwater. The miraculous negotiation of a homeostatic pH is not magic. It is the logic of an ecosystem. By listening to the O'opu and the Hihivai and preserving their natural habitats, 
so we can observe them in action. The water itself may teach us what we need to know to preserve a drinkable water supply on our planet. How not to breach natural ecosystem barriers to salination of fresh water supplies, for example. Little secrets like that. Nature has been desalinating much of its water supply for its entire existence. Perhaps before we engineer systems of our own to do so, we might take the time to malama aina and listen and learn from those elements of the earth already put in place to do so long, long ago.